Hi, I'm Carla Wilczek with Carolot International, and I thought it prudent to start to educate ourselves while we have the time and certainly the initiative to uh, delve into the real information and possibly information that is not out in the general public. So I'm going to start quite um, simply by reading a chapter of a book called Invisible Miracles by Dr. Myron Wentz. And this ain't fiction, folks. So um, I'm going to actually have the words on the screen as I read through. We're going to get educated together. So this book is actually um, 2002, but it's extremely relevant for what's occurring right now. So I'm going to focus on chapter four. I'll just zoom in a little bit here so you can all see it. All right. There was a time when a career as a scientist was, in itself, a noble and life-consuming goal. Basic research involves studies with no specific intent to solve particular problems or with immediate benefits to society. Applied research is directed toward achieving specific results that will affect the well-being of people. Although I had decided not to become a front office health practitioner, I was motivated to create and develop tools that could be used by healthcare professionals in dealing with the scourge of infectious diseases present in our society. In the years immediately following my doctoral studies at the University of Utah, uh, which this man has two PhDs, one in immunology, one in microbiology, I plunged into positions of increasing responsibility in microbiology lab laboratories at several medical clinics and hospitals in the Midwestern United States. I felt a turn in the road looming on the near horizon. In those years, you were expected to use the knowledge you had gained in graduate school to further scientific knowledge without concern for such mundane details as getting the benefits of your discoveries to people and patients. Also, I was beginning to understand the degree of politics and bureaucracy inherent in the institutional scientific community. To exacerbate my dilemma, science, especially medical science, was just beginning to proliferate into big business. I knew I did not want to be an employee of a pharmaceutical company, nor did I want to climb into the ivory tower of basic research or play king of the mountain in some institutional hierarchy. Thinking back to, uh, to the influence of Linus Pauling, the maverick, and relying on entrepreneurial instincts inherited by my father, I took a fork in the road and struck out on my own. There were only two viral diseases at the time, hepatitis and rubella, whose diagnosis could be confirmed in the laboratory. I decided to try my hand at developing badly needed tests for other viral infections. My hope was that such tests could be completed and results reported to physicians before the patients left the hospital much more rapidly than was standard practice, i.e. through symptom symptomology. I returned to Salt Lake City, Utah, where a fully equipped laboratory with cell culture capabilities stood vacant. The facilities had been used by the Salk Institute for Biological Studies, with headquarters in La Jolla, California. Dr. Jonas Salk, founder and developer of the first effective polio vaccine, had a particular interest in a rather obscure viral infection, a Lucian disease, which commercially bred mink were subject to. These mink experiments did not prove fruitful for the Salk team, and their decision to terminate the project was a fortunate event for me. I have great respect for Salk as a scientist and a man of vision. He felt that scientists suffer no failures, only unprofitable avenues to pursue. As a peer of Linus Pauling, Jonas Salk viewed biology as a science 
and as a basic cultural discipline revealing converging relationships between man and the physical universe, between man and the sciences, arts, religion, and humanistic values. So, like Pauling, was not accepted by the establishment. He often commented that the worst tragedy that could have befallen him was his success because of the criticism and envy it spawned within the establishment. He said he couldn't possibly have become a member of his own institute had he found, not founded it himself. And that was a big light bulb for me as to why Dr. Wentz is quite a uh, private scientist not somebody that, given his great accomplishments, is, um, he very much shies away from um, public. I sold everything I owned, got a loan from the Small Business Administration, and bought the equipment needed to develop viral diagnostic assays. My one-man business became complete with a name and a small ongoing laboratory services contract to keep the doors open. It involved electrophoresis for Aleutian disease virus for the Fur Breeders Association. What the laboratory and mink farm failed to do for Salk was a blessing for me, although the aroma during a hot valley inversion was barely tolerable. Gull Laboratories was launched in September 1974, and by June 1977, only two and a half years later, several of my viral diagnostic assays were cleared by the U.S. Food and Drug Administration and were all ready for marketing to clinical and hospital laboratories. I was spurred forward by the knowledge that the large pharmaceutical firms had been attempting for years unsuccessfully to do the same thing I was trying to do. I knew if I was going to compete successfully, despite the huge disparity in financial resources, almost a David against Goliath, I would have to have the most technologically advanced as possible. I decided I would grow all the viruses known at the time to be of diagnostic importance to humans. With these cultures, I could prepare test systems for the diseases these viruses caused, and that's what I did. I decided to focus on the herpes viruses first and develop culture methods and assays for most of them. Those were my, the first such products on the market. The breakthrough test that firmly established the success of Gull Laboratories worldwide was the assay for the Epstein-Barr virus. The world, especially Europe, was waiting for that assay. Of the more than 30 diagnostic tests I developed, the Epstein-Barr virus assay was the one I became identified with in medical diagnostics. It was a test that could not be duplicated elsewhere and to this day remains the gold standard for diagnosing an infection with that virus. At that time when a bacterial infection was diagnosed, the physician had an arsenal of antibiotics to use in eradicating the pathogen. Antiviral drugs, however, were only in the development stage in the 70s, and as a result, many doctors left unsuspected viral infections undiagnosed. There was an alternative diagnostic test for the Epstein-Barr virus, the heterophile test, but it was not very specific and was useless in identifying infection in children. There were two important reasons for testing for infection with EBV. First, atypical mononucleosis, which that virus creates, was important to diagnose because it signaled potential immunolo immunological abnormalities. The second reason was to obtain information that would permit ruling out the numerous disorders that an EBV infection could mimic. An infection with Toxoplasma gondii, for example, could be potentially dangerous for a woman in her first trimester of pregnancy. With no advertising, indeed, virtually no marketing efforts at all. Sales of Gull laboratory or Gull Epstein bar test grew steadily from month to month throughout the world. It was a source of pride for me to have looked beyond the financial rewards that, re that accompany the success of Gull laboratories to the understanding that here was a case of a previously unmet medical need being filled. Here were tools for health professionals that could immediately benefit patients. One reason for my success in developing viral diagnostics was the quality of the cell culture operations at Gull Laboratories. 
viruses cannot reproduce on their own, but must hijack the metabolic machinery of the host cell to manufacture the components, which then go into assembly of the viral particles. I knew that to develop the best viral assays, I had to produce the best viral antigens, but since viruses need host cells to reproduce, I couldn't produce good viruses unless I could grow healthy, fully competent cells. Cells in culture can be very troublesome. After months of vigorous growing, they can suddenly die off without warning. They are very sensitive to their environment, especially to the nutrients in the culture medium. This can be illustrated by an anecdote about a cell culture laboratory that relocated from the east to the west coast. The cell cultures were almost all lost in the new laboratories because of a minor difference in the purity of the water supply. Water had to be transported cross country by air for almost a year before the cells adapted to the new growing conditions. Goal Laboratories had one of the finest cell culture facilities of the day. During my many years of hands-on work with the cultures, I had developed an exceptional training program and attracted and developed some of the industry's best cell culture technologists. As in the, is the case in all sciences, intuition and common sense were valuable allies to the sophisticated equipment and technical know-how required for the specialized science within a science. Among the secrets of our success at Gall Laboratories was a comprehensive knowledge of the nutritional requirements of the different cell lines. With the right combination of all the nutrients essential for life, I could maintain cells in a healthy state almost indefinitely without any signs of degeneration or disease. What I didn't realize at the time was that this knowledge would bring about the revolutionary next stage in my scientific journey. The principles of good nutrition are universal. If we can supply nutrients to the human body in a comprehensive manner on a daily basis with a full spectrum of essential nutrients in the right forms, amounts, and in the proper balance, we can achieve long-term health. Health, after all, begins at a cellular level. So this was chapter four and fundamental to some of the things we'll be learning. Um, this is an icon of science who's won the Albert Einstein Award for his advancements in the life sciences. And uh, as I said before, a very underspoken hero to humanity. And uh, we're going to learn more about him also um, more of the significant advancements in science that brings us to the present day um, and some things that we can tangibly do besides just washing our hands and um, you know distancing ourselves that will protect ourselves in the long term and promote good health so let's journey on together thank you <laughs>